just 72 days to go as Kamala Harris and Donald Trump enter the final phase of the U.S. presidential election. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Caleb, sitting in for Anand Naidu, and you're watching The Heat. Running for the U.S. presidency is neither easy nor inexpensive. Consider this. According to official data between January of 2023 and July 31st of this year, the Biden, now Harris campaign, has raised nearly $517 million, while Trump's campaign took in about $269 million. By all accounts, this election is very close, especially in seven battleground states whose ballots could very likely determine who wins. And that's where both campaigns will be laser focused in the coming days as they begin the final sprint for the White House. Now, for more on this, we turn to CGTN's Poppy Umputing in our newsroom. So, Poppy, just two and a half months out until the election, but early voting starts next month in some states. What can we expect from both campaigns in these last few weeks? Well, Sean, uh, as mentioned, less than uh, three months to go until the election means that both campaigns need to be supercharged in terms of targeting potential voters. Of course, there are those battleground states that the Trump campaign and the Harris campaign will really want to target, especially in terms of those voters who are undecided, uh, because there are a lot of votes up for grabs. Now, of course, the Harris Walls campaign is hitting the ground running. Momentum has been very high since the Democratic National Convention that closed out last week. In just that time, $82 million raised, according to Harris Wall's campaign. And uh, on top of that, a surge of volunteer support. So Harris doing pretty uh, well in terms of connecting with voters, but she still has a case to make, of course, to the American people now that she is sitting atop the presidential ticket. This week, with that in mind, heading to Georgia, a critical battleground state. The south of Georgia is where Tim Walls and Kamala Harris uh, will be traveling through, concluding with a rally on Thursday in Savannah. A reminder to our viewers that the state of Georgia was won by Biden in 2020 by fewer than 12,000 votes. So really uh, a critical state there uh, to gain traction in. For the Trump, Trump Vance campaign, they also have work to do and are getting out to those battleground states uh, this week. Uh, Trump and uh, Vance heading to Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. These are key states which currently Harris is leading Trump when it comes to the latest polls. So there is a lot of uh, work to be done there. And... Um, Important to note that the Trump campaign has said that they are going to be changing their strategy somewhat. They really want Trump to be very visible uh, to potential voters. They'll be holding a range of different events, whether it's small, intimate town halls or large rallies. And the Trump campaign has also beefed up its political strategy and advisory uh, co um, contributors there, too. And everybody wants to hear these two candidates square off face to face, talk about the issues. So what about the debate? Because now there's a debate about the debate on September 10th. It popped up basically overnight. Bring us up to speed on that. Yeah, this uh, September 10th debate has been very much front and center today, Sean. Uh, Donald Trump casting doubt over whether he will participate. And that comes as he is accusing ABC, that's the U.S. network, that will be hosting uh, the debate next month of being biased. He says that he uh, watched... Uh, the TV yesterday, Sunday, and was not impressed by how they had uh, engaged with a Republican senator. And with that, he took to Truth Social. That, of course, is Trump's uh, social media network. And he said, I quote, why would I do the debate with Harris on that network? Now, this, of course, uh, if it feels like deja vu, is because he made a similar uh, threats, if you like, uh, earlier this month, uh, saying that he might pull out. That was when he was unimpressed that the presidential ticket had changed from Biden to Harris. You'll remember, of course, that this September 10th debate has always been on the docket, but previously was slated to be between Trump and 
Biden. So on top of that, we've also had the two campaigns wrangling today. The Harris campaign saying that for the September debate, they want the microphones to be fully open, whereas the Trump campaign wants to stick to the rules of the earlier CNN debate that uh, Biden and Trump had previously engaged in, where the microphones are only on for those for that individual who is speaking. Now, you'll remember that in the 2020 uh, campaign, uh, Trump was pretty famous for interrupting Biden very many times, which is the reason why hot microphones are key to this issue. Okay. Thank you very much, Poppy. That's CGTN's Poppy Mputing reporting. Okay, so there is a lot to talk about. Let's get right to our panel. We'll begin Eric Bowling. He's the best-selling author and host of The Eric Bowling Show. Good to see you again. Niambi Carter, an associate professor in the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Also good to see you again. Brandon Bryce, a conservative columnist and secretary of the Delaware Republican Party. And here in the lovely borough of Washington, D.C., Frank Cessna, who wears a number of hats, George Washington University, among them professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs. And, of course, Frank previously served as the bureau chief for CNN here in Washington, D.C. Frank, I'm going to start with you to kind of uh, quote Poppy, campaigns need to be supercharged right now. Let's take a look at where things are right now. The conventions are over. Uh, the campaigns are both out there doing what they can. The battleground states are obviously going to be extremely key. And depending on which poll you look at and which hour, it's going to be very tight. Break it down for us. What do these two candidates, what do they need to do in the, in the next 70 plus days? Well, Kamala Harris needs to keep her momentum going. She went into the convention. She came out of the surprise announcement, obviously, that Biden wasn't going to run. Went into the convention and comes out of the convention with enormous energy. You mentioned earlier that uh, her campaign is saying they've raised over half a billion dollars, more than $500 million over a five-week period. That's just phenomenal. Twice what Donald Trump raised. Uh, she's got um, a, a, an army of volunteers across the country the campaign is saying has signed up and certainly the energy level at that convention and at her rallies are quite remarkable the kinds of things that donald trump likes to brag about that is powerful jet fuel for a campaign especially when there's so little time and i don't think we can minimize and shouldn't for people who are watching around the world mm -hmm. from around the world how important that energy is because these people go back to their states, their cities, their towns. They knock on doors. They put out yard signs. They tell people who, ah, I'm not sure I'm going to vote. Gee, you really shouldn't. Here's why. That and other get out the vote uh, things really work. What else does she need to do? She needs to keep owning the agenda in the media to the extent that she can and keep Trump on the defensive to the extent that she can. What does Trump need to do? He needs to reassert itself, reassert it himself. He has been very much and very visibly knocked off balance here, and he's had a hard time getting his narrative back out front, simply, for one reason anyway, simply because Harris is so new. So she's sort of the, the novel person, the new person on the block, and now he becomes old news. Uh, he's used to dominating the media space. He's used to being the quote meister here who can do an attack or make a comment, and that's what runs through the media. That's not happening so much anymore, and it's why I think this debate over the debate, as you put it, is so fascinating, because in a race that looks this close, he needs everybody he can get, both candidates do, yeah. and they're going to need to confront one another and see what they can add to what they've got. Uh, Eric Bowling, uh, you sounded the alarm following Vice President uh, Kamala Harris's acceptance speech at the DNC last week and saying Republicans need to wake the F up. We are losing. Tell me specifically what you saw and what concerns you the most right now. I saw everything Frank just, just mentioned. I saw half a billion dollars being raised. I saw, I saw an enthusiasm level that I haven't seen on the Democrat side for, you know, even prior to the 2020 election. There, that, there was no enthusiasm for, for Joe Biden in 2020. They, he was the guy who had the best chance of beating Trump. But and I also saw a reinvention of Kamala Harris. And then most importantly, and the reason why I said wake the F up is because it seemed like the Trump camp was allowing all this to go on. And, and, and I said, you got to stop. In fact, today, I called into the Trump senior top advisors to the campaign. I said, what the hell are you guys doing? I watched Trump in Michigan a couple of days ago. I watched him today. Great. It was fantastic. He went to Arlington National Cemetery. He laid a wreath in honor of the 13 military members we lost three years ago today 
in, in Afghanistan. That was very presidential. And then I heard him do a policy speech. But when I listen to him and I watch him on TV now, I see a very quiet, a solemn Donald Trump. I said, you guys can't do this. Don't put that man out there. Put the Trump out there that when he's gregarious, when he's loud, when he laughs, when he engages, people fall in love with them. And it was almost like they were saying, well, yeah, okay, well, let's get through Labor Day. Are you out of your mind? You're going to end up with 58, 57 days to win this. I will tell you, I, unequivocally, Kamala Harris has caught up in the swing states with even with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I think right. that gives a little bit of edge to Trump. But just let me finish this one sure. final thought. The, he will get Kamala on the debate stage. This whole wrangling and that he's poking her and she's poking him. It's only to see if he can get her to do two debates because, as I said, if you listen today on the, on, on the uh, Eric Bowling show, get him getting her on that debate stage, he will win. It doesn't matter if it's ABC, if George Stephanopoulos used to work for, for uh, the Clintons. It doesn't matter if John Carl and, and whomever else is asking the questions. They're wildly biased to Kamala Harris, much like the setup and a lot of people I'm listening to tonight are, it doesn't matter. Donald Trump is Mike Tyson in his heyday. Gets him, gets her in the ring, he knocks her out. Okay, but uh, let's go back to a bit about what you're talking about, Trump. Uh, get him out there saying what he wants to say. Uh, his staff has been trying to keep him on point, focus on the issues. But Trump is a guy who loves to talk about crowd sizes. He loves to talk about who's better looking. He loves to talk about TV ratings. And if you look at the crowd sizes Harris is getting, and if you look at the ratings the last night of the DNC, are the Democrats being successful at putting Trump in a box? They are. They're, they're, they, they landed a punch, so to speak. I'll use the boxing analogy again. They landed a punch. They didn't knock him out, but he certainly staggered. I don't think he saw that coming. But don't forget, you're still talking about the guy who can make anyone laugh. He's the guy who says outrageous things, and, and the people who hate him are going to go, oh, he's disgusting. And the people who, who just go, wow, here's a New York billionaire who was president who says the things that I'm thinking, mm -hmm. that's the Trump that will get the people back on his side. It's not too late. But again, once you get Kamala Harris talking about policy with another, with Trump, uh, forget, it's over. And the reason why she wants to keep the mics open, she thinks she's going to be able to prod him into being, uh, a, a, the, the, what he did with, in, in 2020, what he did with other candidates, what he did even with Hillary, they don't, that's not very becoming. CNN did an amazing thing. They taught Trump how to pick your moments and land the solid punches. If I, I, it doesn't matter I, it, when he gets her in the policy policy ring, so to speak, with the debate, he can't lose. She has no policy to run on, only failures. Okay, uh, Niambi, I want to get your reaction to that uh, firstly, and then I want to ask you a bit about the issue of reproductive rights and the abortion issue, because it was brought up a great deal at the Democratic National Convention, and the Democrats are accusing uh, the Republicans of basically favoring a national ban. But I, I want to play you a bit of what uh, J.D. Vance said about that over the weekend. Donald Trump's view is that we want the individual states and their individual cultures and their unique political sensibilities to make these decisions because we don't want to have a nonstop federal conflict over this issue. The federal government ought to be focused on getting food prices down and getting housing prices down. But no Republican, at least no Republican within with any reasonable power, is saying that we should have a complete national abortion ban. Okay, uh, Naomi, if I can get your reaction to that. And also, does Harris have a record to stand on? Um, so I'll take the, the, the latter first. I mean, yes, she's been elected three separate times to something. So it's not as if she's coming in here with no previous electoral successes. Now, you might not like what her policy um, is. She might not have been successful in all things, but to say that she has nothing, that she doesn't know policy, that she's thin, I think is, is playing her a bit short. Um, and essentially saying that she fooled all the people of California and Americans many times over um, into believing what something that she Name wasn't. One. I didn't cut Maybe. you off. Please don't Hang on, Eric. Let, put, put, please, please let her finish. Okay. okay. I said policy. Um, I didn't say she was elected. I said she has no policy. Eric, well, I, I think you're wrong. wrong. Eric, but please let her can, finish, and then I'm we can come back. We did this last time. So the other part of this, in terms of what J.D. Vance is saying, I think he's being disingenuous. I think J.D. Vance is walking it back because what Republicans saw is that the abortion issue is a loser. When it's put to the states, um, women, even Republican women, are reticent 
to uh, support more restrictions on health care. You can call abortion whatever you want, but it's health care ultimately. Yeah. And what I think Republicans have not addressed, and please let me finish this thought, please, um, have not addressed is the fact that if you want to take abortion off the table, which many of them do, I'm not saying all of them do, uh, if you want to take abortion off the table, then you also have to talk about social welfare provision, which people don't seem to want to talk about, because the reasons why women want to seek abortions in addition to health are also the inability to access um, health care, inability to access birth control, inability to access supports. So I think there's is if you really care about a culture of life, then you have to really talk about supporting life, not just birth. And I think that's where uh, J.D. Vance is coming from. He's trying to walk back that position, but I think it's disingenuous to suggest that there is no desire or a sense that they want to move mm -hmm. toward a national abortion ban, because if that was the case, then you could have just left Roe v. Wade in place. Um, uh, Brandon, both candidates are getting advice on how to operate their campaigns as we head into this uh, final stretch. And as we mentioned, Trump's team has basically said, stay on the issues, avoid the uh, personal attacks. I want to play you uh, just a bit of what Jennifer Lawless had to say. She is a political science professor mm -hmm. at the University of Virginia. I think Donald Trump has to do a couple of things. The first is he needs a debate performance that highlights that he's disciplined and able to stick to the issues. The other thing that Donald Trump needs to do is make a case for a second term when his first term led to a lot of the problems that Joe Biden inherited. And also, he needs to make the case that electing Donald Trump is not moving backward, it's also moving forward. That was a lot easier to do when he was running against an incumbent president. Kamala Harris has turned the page, and she's running as her own candidate, and she's not running as for a second term of the Biden administration. Well, Brandon, I thank you for your patience. Uh, let, let me get you uh, to respond to that. Well, first of all, let's look at this. Three months ago, no one was even talking about Kamala Harris because the reality Kamala. is she had yeah. no record, and, and we knew that. Now, all of a sudden, she's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I think that's disingenuous. The other piece to that, one thing I will agree with that this professor did say is Donald Trump, you know, when you look at it, if I had to give him some advice, I would say stay on the issues and be quiet. The problem is that there's been many statements that have been made where people are saying, wait a minute, you know, that reminds me of the issue that we had in his first presidency. The flip side to that, though, when you look at Kamala Harris, I think it is a danger in her campaign not to do uh, 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 interviews and, 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 and actually run towards the interviews. We're talking about less than 72 days until the election. And the reality is many Americans, whether they like her or not, whether the Obamas are backing her, they don't know who she is. And the reality is when you look at high inflation, conflicts across the country, people are saying, you know what, even though the DNC convention had all these celebrities, which we knew Hollywood was all up in there, but the reality is we don't know her. We didn't really know any of our accomplishments as the vice president. And this is this election is too close to support or vote in a candidate that, quite frankly, we still don't know what she stands for. I would say, you know, she's got to she's got to run to the press. I think Donald Trump has to get focused on a few issues. And the most important thing, he's got to convince independent and women voters that he is better than the incumbent vice president. If he can't, it could be a very different conversation in November. OK, um, Frank, I, I think a lot of Democrats are worried about some kind of scenario where the Trump camp could say, OK, let's flip a coin. Tails, I win. Heads, I sue. Or we do it again. Uh, look at what happened to the, the Republican National Committee. Uh, he's basically gone in there, cleaned house. Uh, his daughter-in-law is now has a very powerful position in there. And the RNC has already filed a number of lawsuits challenging voting rules. Now, the Democrats, too, are also gearing up, mobilizing a ro robust legal team, especially in a state like Georgia, which razor-thin uh, margin made it uh, in the last election. Okay, so talk about that, the efforts to lay the groundwork and the concerns that if Trump loses again, he digs in his heels again and we have a protracted legal fight at best and something that spills over into violence at worst. Well, yes, <laughs> you know, that is exactly the situation that we're seeing or the danger, the risk. You know, what, uh, what Donald Trump is doing is, and his campaign is doing, is raising questions and, and trying to get people onto state election committees and that kind of thing to look at every move that might be made that might raise concerns and then raise those questions and have a have a, an outcome. Georgia is the key 
uh, place right now where people are looking at this. But I think, you know, this narrative is very well established. And what's, what's, what's been happening uh, is that Donald Trump has activated his team. So have the Democrats, by the way. The Democrats have lawyered up. And no one should, they're not going to be doing, not necessarily the same things in terms of accusing the outcome of being fraudulent, but if they don't like it, I'm sure we'll be hearing from them too. In any case, what we will have is certainly if this is close and if we have early votes, absentee ballots being opened out of sequence, whether before or after, as before, a lot of questions, a lot of conspiracy theories and a lot of very angry people, they're already teed up to do this. This is very concerning and probably the most concerning thing of all are the threats that many local election workers who thought they were just doing their civic duty to show up and show people where to vote and, you know, hand them their, their card or whatever it is, uh, they're being threatened directly and indirectly. So it's a very uncomfortable situation that could lead to uh, potentially be a very dangerous situation. Eric, I want to give you a chance now to talk a bit about Harris and does she have a platform to stand on? She has talked about a plan for a federal ban on price, on price gouging, everything from grocery stores uh, to you name it. Anybody who's covered a natural disaster, an earthquake, a, a tornado, especially hurricanes, know that there are laws in there against price gouging. Is this an effective way to roll out where you're going to plant your flag and really fight for the uh, American consumer? No, they're, they're already walking that back, Sean. Um, you know, first to Niambi, I, I still am waiting to hear a policy win from Kamala Harris. I'm not, I'm not questioning whether she won an election, whether she became a U.S. senator winning a national election, or whether she's vice, chosen to be vice president. She has no policy wins to stand on, none, 0.0. .0. I'm, I'll still wait to hear what your answer is to that. However, the, the, the idea that her first idea, her first, I will do this, instead of you know, here's the, every single American right now is going, well, you had three and a half, almost four years to do some of these things. Why didn't you? Okay, forget that. You want to tell us what you're going to do now, day one, even though this is day four years later. It, the first thing she says, no tax on tips. That's something Trump rolled out four months ago. So she stole the first idea. And the next one is, we're going to tell companies not to gouge, price gouge. That's price controls and Every economist, I don't care if you're right, left, or center, will tell you when you start telling companies how much they can and can't make and right. get government involved in price fixing, you've ruined the economy and you've ruined the government. So I will stand aside and let me hear about these wonderful policy wins from Kamala Harris's history. Uh, excuse me. Niambi, would you like to, to take the ball and run with it here? Well, let me just say this. I don't work for the CARES campaign, and I don't have to answer any questions from Eric, much to his chagrin. If he would like, he can research it like everyone else. I know he has Google on everything else. So, no, I will actually take a question from the person who's hosting the program. Okay, let's talk about the debate uh, coming up. What is Harris going to have to do during the debate? She is going to have to answer specific questions. Where's your platform? What are you going to run on? How is she going to do that, especially when she was the border czar? And that is one area that has been picked apart for the last four years. Well, she's not a border czar. I know we like to use that term. That's not her job. And she's actually the vice president, so her job is to support the president. If anybody else here can tell me what the policy wins of previous vice presidents, I would like to hear them, because no one said the word Mike Pence yet. But that said, I think what she's going to have to do is definitely tell us how she's going to be different than Donald Trump. But more importantly, she's going to have to make it clear that what she's offering is going to be something different than Joe Biden. I think one of the criticisms that she's gotten is that this just seems like Biden part two. How is she going to be different? How is she separate? from him. And so I think for her, her debate performance, she can't get rattled because unlike my colleagues, I can say a couple of nice things about Donald Trump, which is he actually is good on the debate stage when he's focused and when he's disciplined. So one of the things she has to contend with, the fact that he is not a politician, he is a showman. And so to do that, she can't just say, you know, policy, 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 right. and he gets all the, the notable quotables, right? She actually has to be thinking about her showmanship in the same way that she's thinking about policy and all of that. So she's going to actually have to show that she's different from Joe Biden, and she's going to actually show that Donald Trump won't rattle her, because he will. He will try, and he's done it before. He is very good, um, uh, much that people like to deny it. Brandon, pick up on that. How important is this debate? And we know that Trump's staff has been working with him on the best way to approach Kamala Harris. 
This debate is extremely important because this debate, let's be very clear, most people at this point know if they're going to vote for Trump. Most Republicans know they're going to vote for Trump. Most Democrats know they're going to vote for Kamala. This is for independent voters. And, you know, the one thing I will say is the reality is that, you know, with Kamala Harris, you know, she's kind of, there's nothing really great about her outside the fact she's the vice president. There's nothing, you know, that's me. Donald Trump, he's a showman. He's funny. People like being on stage. I think I agree with my colleague, ironically, that for Donald, for, you know, if you're Donald Trump, you've got to hit the issues mm -hmm. and you've got to convince women and independent voters why they need to go with you. If you're Kamala Harris, you've got to separate yourself, in my opinion, from the Biden administration to yeah. say, listen, as the vice president, that job is to protect the president's interests. It's my show now. It's my time. If she cannot convince people on the first debate, uh, I think Trump will get it. Trump has name ID. People know who he is. And at the end of the day, uh, the fact that there was a you know reference that right. the vice president was running away from the press, was not getting aggressive about getting in the media and telling her plan, who she is, what she plans to do, I think it'll hurt the Kamala campaign in, 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 in November. Uh, uh, and uh, Naomi, we have time for one more question here. I want to talk about today the 104th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. And at the Democratic National Convention, uh, a number of women wearing white to honor the suffragette movement. Uh, I want to play you just a bit about what Patrice Marshall McKenzie, one of the delegates, had to say about this important date. I think that we're going to see a shift in leadership for women. We're going to see black women be seen as leaders and not just laborers. We're going to see doors open for women to lead in all kind of places that they had not been able to lead before, had not been open to lead, had not had the courage to lead. And I just see opportunity for policy change. You're going to see a diversity of voices in different rooms than they have been before. Okay, your thoughts on that. How important would that be to really open up a lot of doors that haven't been opened? I mean, I think it's it's going to be extremely important. We've never seen a woman uh, in, in the White House. I mean, and certainly women is 50 percent of the population are underrepresented in all levels of government. And I think it's going to be really important to have a person who has a name that we have to you know, think a little bit more about pronouncing properly. Her name is Kamala, not Kamala. It's Kamala. And I think that kind of... Um, exercise in, in thinking about other people and those other people being women is, is a really important thing for our nation and for the young women, yeah. regardless of your, your policy preferences or your, your uh, political okay. leanings, to see and to strive for. Okay. I want to thank you very much. We are out of time. Uh, enjoy the conversation. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Sean Caleb's in Washington, D.C. As always, thanks for watching, everyone.